Good morning and good afternoon and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Max Bergman. I'm the director of the Stort Center and the Europe, Russia, Eurasia program here at CSIS. We're delighted uh, to have you all with us virtually for this uh, conversation with Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine, Olga, Olga St uh, St Stefanoshina. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister is in charge of all things EU accession and, the, uh, and is uh, a front and center in the e Ukraine's effort to join the European Union, which is a critical part of Ukraine's future. Uh, let me give a few words on the Deputy Prime Minister's bio. Uh, she formerly worked as Director of the Government Office for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration of the Secretariat of the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine in 2017. Uh, she was then made Director General uh, and of the Government Office for Coordination of European and Euro-Atlantic Integration. Uh, on June 4th, 2020, she was appointed Deputy Prime Minister for this portfolio, uh, and she was awarded the Diploma of the Cabinet Ministers of Ukraine. So uh, we are delighted to have you, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, with us today uh, for what is a really important conversation. You have been uh, uh, engaged uh, with the European Union uh, in the uh, enlargement process now for uh, uh, many, many number of years. Um, I'm curious maybe to start off the conversation, if you could maybe describe kind of how things have evolved since February of last year. Uh, you, of course, been working this portfolio uh, in the, the, the pre-conflict or at least pre-2022 environment. Uh, how have things changed over the last year or and, and hopefully accelerated? Well, uh, thank you so much for recollecting in my memory, my profile as well. It's something that always brings me to the, the good old times we had. And uh, uh, probably uh, uh, I'll also have to mention that I cover your Atlantic profile, which is related to uh, joining uh, of Ukraine to NATO. And at some point uh, now when we are um, extremely concentrated on the political reforms agenda, it's equally important both for NATO and for, for EU accession uh, processes. Um, I just wanted to bring uh, to our audience the understanding of uh, the spirit which brought us to uh, submitting the uh, application for membership in uh, European Union, which has happened on 28th of February 2024, uh, 22, just four days after the beginning of the full scale um, uh, aggression of Russian Federation with more than 50% of the territory uh, of Ukraine occupied by that moment. Um, uh, in fact, um, since the revolution of dignity, we had a, a really long track record of reforms uh, accomplished, uh, targeted to bring us closer with our uh, Western partners, to uh, integrate us into the structures, to meet the highest democratic and economic standards of, uh, of uh, the way state is operating. And basically, since the morning of 24th of February, we have seen uh, all of our accomplishments evaporating literally, physically, and, uh, and, and spiritually, I would say, because uh, waking up in the morning, we wouldn't know, even as politicians, whether, um, uh, whether we will survive, but also uh, we wanted to set in stone, at least in the memory of the world, uh, the, the state we were before 21st of February, everything we managed to build and, and everything we cherished. So, uh, so uh, it was extremely important for us that shortly after we filed the application for membership, all the U27 members of states in Paris approved it and made a decision that Ukraine will join uh, to the European Union, which has been an extremely important geopolitical step, confirming that 27 EU member states will stand with Ukraine, regardless the development of the war, and gave us the understanding what will come after the war will be ending. And let me remind you that by the time, speaking of these dates, uh, it was still the time when Kyiv region, even Kyiv region was occupied. Central areas of Ukraine were under occupation. Uh, uh, borderings with Belarus region were still occupied. And again, every 24 hours were not clear 
uh, for us uh, what would be happening. So the horizon of planning was 24 hours. So, uh, I mean, this has been so far one of the major geopolitical decisions which allowed to preserve and cement this unity um, of standing with Ukraine, uh, but also it has given a huge moral boost to, to the armed forces and to the people just to get to know that we're not alone. We have a broad coalition of state, states who are standing with us and will keep on standing with us as long as it is needed. And of course, this decision affected many other decisions afterwards, like granting Ukraine the candidate status, starting actually the enlargement process, uh, boosting the energy over sanctions, restrictions, mobilizing macrofinancial assistance in the amount of 8 billion euros, uh, but also, I mean, starting the new era of European Union, but by planning the defense industry development itself and making a decision Decisions on military support of Ukraine, uh, which is not like a natural profile of, of European Union. So, so uh, indeed, this is a historical decision from, from the many perspectives. But um, it uh, also allowed us as a government to find ourselves uh, uh, in, a, in a new capacity of the government running to, in times of war. So we managed to preserve the full um, uh, the full uh, um, uh, operation of the government institutions at all level, from local to central, including parliament, from second one, when the first jet and first bomb has been shot in Ukraine, we never stopped being, uh, uh, we never stopped operating. We managed to accomplish all our social, medical, financial, uh, financial obligations at the state, and in fact, uh, it's, uh, it's, it might sound uh, absolutely unrealistic, but we have a very stable financial system, financial sector, banking sector throughout all of the period of war. And um, I mean, after Ukraine has been granted a candidate status, we have also made a decision and it was a very clear message from my president that like not all of us politicians are standing with a gun on a forefront. Uh, not all of us uh, are physically fighting for, for the country, but all of us have specific mandates and we should deliver on them for 100%. And that allowed us to prioritize and to structure the processes related to political reforms. So uh, now we are uh, in, uh, in, a, in a very good political shape. So we have this energy and support. More than 91% of Ukrainian people support European integration. Uh, we have a fully booked agenda of Ukrainian parliament voting the EU-related legislation. And uh, uh, I have a privilege as the deputy prime minister in charge of EU affairs of having a full green light on all the political reforms needed to be done, uh, which in fact already resulted in uh, um, completing the composition of all anti-corruption structures, um, setting up the ground for them to show and, and showing the clear track record of the corruption cases. We completed selection and uh, established all the elements of the judiciary, which now have to show the results and, the, uh, and again, its operation. We also... Um, managed to set up the media market, which is also a bit su surrealistic because from one side, we have some restrictions related to the war in terms of the excess of information, informational uh, informational uh, clarity and etc. But at the same time, it's first time since the independence when we have set the clear rules for, uh, for operating in a media market, which you know has been a long history of uh, shareholders from the various groups of interests, and this has not been a structured uh, uh, market uh, which has been subjected to various manipulations, where uh, whether it was the election process or any other political process related to the state. So, so uh, this is uh, something that we have the full energy to deliver on, and of course, uh, it is very well seen um, uh, in in Brussels and other other capitals. And uh, and in your US, uh, by the way, which has uh, clearly stated that delivering on seven political criteria is equally important for your Atlantic integration, but generally on completing all of this discussion about Ukraine be being a democratic and rules based order state and uh, um, again cutting off this major Russian narratives on Ukraine as a failed 
state on Ukraine is a corrupt state and etc. So uh, I think uh, that this has been a major process uh, within the country. And then what we're saying basically that European integration is the priority for our for our country. We're not talking that much uh, about the accession itself. We're talking about the fact that this is the roadmap of reforms, which preserves the unity within the country, keeps us focused and structured, keeps our intentions and plans clear to our partners, but also uh, allows us to support our people with our accomplishments through throughout the work. No, thank you so much for that overview. And I think, you know, one of the things for uh, an American audience that uh, looks at EU membership akin to sort of NATO membership is just, well, just let them into the club. But as you are sort of pointing out, uh, it's an incredibly thorough and detailed process where laws have to be changed. And I, it, it strikes me as, you know, what Ukraine in some ways is trying to do is, is unprecedented in the history of European enlargement where you have a war going on at the same time you're trying to uh, change uh, a lot of your laws and, and regulations to match uh, the EU. And, but it also strikes me that that creates an opportunity of real political unity. Uh, I'm curious if, if uh, you know, post 2014, but pre-2020 too, was there the same sort of political unity? Would, the legislation that's been passed over the last year been much more difficult, for instance, to to get through. Uh, has the war kind of galvanized uh, Ukrainian politicians and the Ukrainian public in a real unity of effort that then enables maybe getting legislation that would be really tough to get through politically has has been uh, has really been enabled uh, by the by the unity of effort. Uh, well, that's that's a very interesting question. I can I can say that. Uh, uh, it, 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 things were not that obvious when I just took over the post uh, because we had a, a, a young uh, government and and, and only uh, only elected uh, uh, parliament and a president who's been uh, actively engaged in, in implementation of his uh, election campaign uh, uh, agenda. And uh, it took us quite a time to structure the agenda and the priorities. But when it has been done, uh, both on NATO and on EU track, uh, there's been um, a very well structured and organized process. But the major challenge before before uh, Ukraine started the enlargement process, that it was uh, in fact association, it was uh, it was cooperation, and whenever you had to put on the agenda something related affecting the domestic market, something something setting up the the rules for the competition or additional regulatory burden. Um, in terms of the quality or uh, or the customers' protection, everybody were asking, why do we have to do it? And simple justification that it is good for people is not always uh, working. And now, basically, this question is out of the agenda because everything, uh, every decision taken is is leading to uh, a very specific element of the process, whether it's like political assessment of Ukraine or it's um, uh, support in terms of reconstruction or financial framework, or it would uh, lessen our burden when it will come to the accession process. So things are much more clear now, and uh, it is clear that the deadlines uh, is something that depends on us as well. And we understand that the speed of our delivery, the speed in the way we are delivering on the reforms agenda, um, uh, strengthens us as a state, because prepares us for the victory. It makes like, it increases the level of our preparedness, but also uh, it uh, lays the ground for a political decisions to be taken on every step of the way. So uh, there's much more clarity in terms of the end game, uh, you know, of the process. And in fact, I, I, I just also wanted to mention that um, accession to NATO is to some extent very different from the accession to European Union, because um, joining the EU, we join the, uh, the 500 million customers market with the access to uh, a billions of customers market across the globe. And it requires to survive as well physically, I mean, being, being a player in this ocean. Uh, in terms of NATO, I think... Um, Ukraine is the now the most uh, should be the most uh, wished country to join NATO. Uh, a, a part of the current security situation, I see no other preconditions which could be the obstacle to that. So, to some extent, it, it's it's an um, 
option uh, which lays within the political surface only. And maybe just to, to touch on that a bit, I mean, how do you see um, NATO membership and EU membership working together? Do you think, uh, you know, does one have to come before the other? Uh, many of your your neighbors just to the west of you in, in, in with Poland and, and Hungary and others became NATO members first and then uh, and then EU members. Do you see that playing out that way or is are they just will move at however fast they can move each track kind of independently? Uh, well, uh, well, there of course there's no like clear linkage, you know, been, between this or two. But to some extent, I mean, membership in one of the organization um, it makes it more naturally. Let's say consider that the membership of uh, in, in NATO or EU is uh, is more uh, is more natural uh, as well. But I think that uh, both of these elements are um, something which is related to our preparedness for the post-war country. Uh, country running and in terms of European Union it's absolutely clear uh, um, that by the end of the war uh, on the battlefield I mean when the war is over on the battlefield we will do everything possible and in fact it's already planned by the end of the year to make sure that we are prepared uh, in terms of the regulatory framework, economic framework, financial framework for reconstruction, transparency, and et cetera, and operating. Uh, in terms of NATO, it's equally uh, important to be ready to take the decision in a very specific time when the security situation will allow, because NATO is also a huge, uh, a huge administrative and military infrastructure. And it, it is absolutely natural that all the capacity we've managed to build throughout the war with the unique experience nobody literally in the world has so far disseminated through NATO infrastructure benefit from that um, uh, and thus benefit uh, for the purposes of the security. So my particular task is to make sure that when there is a window of opportunity for making the decision, for making the decision, we are prepared for that. Yes, I think indeed on the on the military side, uh, oftentimes countries, you know, we in the United States think, that, well, there's a lot that those countries' militaries need to learn from us. But in this case, uh, we're learning a ton from from the efforts of, of Ukraine, and then of course, as the as your military is being modernized and recapitalized through uh, equipment transfers, uh, becoming more uh, uh, more of a NATO uh, force essentially with greater interoperability. Um, so. Uh, I want to maybe turn to the EU process a bit. There was uh, an EU uh, delegation, the, the College of, of, of uh, uh, Commissioners came, uh, came to Kyiv um, and to talk about Ukraine's progress. Maybe you could shed some light on what were those conversations like um, and, uh, and what, what came out of, of those, those meetings. Uh, well, many things, many things uh, came out. Uh, uh, one of the major thing is that uh, the I think it's very important just to 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 uh, spell it out that uh, basically uh, the speed of internal transformations in Ukraine has been shown uh, at at such high high level that uh, it was decided that we're not going to wait until autumn to proceed with the enlargement assessment before taking any political decisions that we can we are not the country and the politicians who will be able to spend another half a year um, uh, keep on guessing what should be done next that's why following this visit to ukraine the decision has been taken that ukraine will be assessed in spring so that we have, I mean, this leverage uh, of half a year to close the pending loopholes before advocating for a political decision on the on the accession talks. I also think that uh, uh, this decision itself shows that the dynamics is extremely high and, and we really need to preserve these dynamics internally as well. Uh, this uh, this resulted from, again, political consultations, which has been held here uh, in Kiev. Uh, also, we made a decision that throughout the negotiation process, uh, throughout the accession process, we will uh, prioritize uh, Ukraine's integration into EU single market, uh, even without being a member of European Union. We have made a lot of like decisions already 
So we signed a special program called Single Market, where Ukraine is the only country outside of the uh, EU borders which will benefit uh, benefit fr from that. And of course, uh, we've been um, uh, discussing the new the evolution of European Union uh, in terms of the common security and defense policy. And it again resulted with the very specific decisions taken uh, taken recently on uh, uh, 1 billion elements of the ammunition through uh, 1 million, sorry, 1 million elements. Uh, we we dreamed of 1 billion, but 1 million elements of the uh, ammunition within 12 months to be delivered uh, by a European Union as a legal commitment. I think that this is something which we literally couldn't have Im imagined uh, uh, not a year ago but like never happening so and um, basically launching the new uh, era of european regulations covering defense industry as an industrial sector uh, in fact i think that this uh, this is something that paved the way towards a very structured again uh, agenda for the next year and again having all european commissioners uh, in kiev uh, is uh, something uh, which is uh, unprecedented in times of peace, but speaking of in the times of war, it also uh, has been very important to us. And for me personally, it was very hard, uh, heartwarming because uh, all of these commissioners are true friends of Ukraine. They've been here many times uh, over the last year. Some of them have just came to Ukrainian border uh, already on 27th of February. Some of them has taken a really serious responsibility just to save Ukrainian people, to give them everything they need to release and open the borders, to uh, synchronize Ukraine with the um, European energy network, which basically helped us all to survive through the winter. And uh, it was a very, very warm, uh, warm meeting between the friends, in fact. Well, that's that's great to hear, and I think your point about uh, uh, the EU's decision to uh, pool resources and buy ammunition and 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 uh, transfer ammunition to Ukraine, the one five five millimeter mortar rounds. I mean, it's truly unprecedented. It kind of shows how Ukraine is accelerating. Uh, not Ukraine isn't just taking action that is uh, advancing its path to EU membership, but is doing a lot to accelerate European integration itself. Um, I'm I'm curious maybe to go through some of the issues that you brought up. Now, you have heard again and again sort of ad nauseum at this point, I think, about uh, Ukraine's quote unquote corruption issues. Now, a lot of this is sort of the legacy of the kind of pre-Maidan, uh, pre-revolution of dignity uh, issues. But, but Ukraine having uh, an economy that was dominated by oligarchs, part uh, particularly uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, and maybe you could talk about the actions that, that you all have taken um, in the recent years, especially in the last year, uh, to address these issues. And I'm curious uh, if you know the, the EU reaction has been positive to, to the steps that you've taken. Uh, well, uh, this is like, you know, I can speak about that for, 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 for hours because, I mean, this is so resonating whenever I'm coming um uh, somewhere abroad uh, tripping uh, my, my trips uh, business trips uh, to some other countries when i hear that it's just like blowing my mind you know uh, but probably i will start with a very uh, very like important message which will just uh, set the basis for for uh, for the next remarks on my side uh, a week ago uh, greco uh, this is the major um, uh, council of europe organizations assessing all countries uh, in terms of the anti corruption efforts has released the report of Ukraine where it recognized Ukraine's efforts over the year as remarkable. So as remarkable, um, not uh, ju uh, justifying it uh, because of the war, etc. In fact, over this year, we managed to deliver on uh, the set of recommendations we have never been delivering for, for years and decades. And again, um, and now the major thing is that the institutions formed and the leaders of these institutions and anti-corruption nominated, uh, they show um, a track record uh, on their activity. So we have 
a fully operational established uh, anti-corruption court uh, and uh, national anti-corruption bureau and specialized anti-corruption prosecutor and agency targeted to prevent the corruption and verify declaration and assets of the of the officials all of these institutions has been formed by the specific commissions with the majority of presence of international experts from us eu and other countries uh and other countries of a democratic Democratic camp uh, with the eight to nine to ten uh, way elements of of the selection filters and process. So you, uh, these people fulfill the highest possible standards of integrity and uh, and, and professionalism. So and and uh, in fact. Uh, we already see a very sustainable track record in the convictions and, and, and delivering uh, on, the, on the criminal proceedings. But also we have adopted the uh, anti-corruption strategy uh, from the agency to prevent corruption, which covers every measure should, which should be taken on the sectoral basis. Um, uh, well, and, and of course, we, uh, we have, uh, as you've mentioned, um, uh, approved the law or anti-oligarch law so far. So this is, uh, this is a very world first precedent when we have uh, made this as a legislation just to first and foremost recognize the very fact that we have su such legacy. So this law is about recognition of the very fact of this legacy. Second, it's about transparency. It's not about like tracing, naming and shaming of, of uh, oligarchs and putting the names uh, somewhere. It's about uh, ensuring the transparency of their operation. So it's like something look like uh, like uh, like the legislation on the lobbyism, uh, lobby legislation, etc. So they have to to be public about. Um, uh, owning the shares and the media business, they have to be public about the sponsoring of the political parties, they have to be public about the meetings they have, which is the normal practice. And uh, basically, without even due enforcement throughout the war, because it's extremely complicated to prioritize these issues while we are trying to survive, this law has played its role. The most, the, the top Google list uh, you can uh, you can identify uh, on Ukraine have sold their shares in the media business publicly. They announced that. Uh, none of them has any hunger in sponsoring any political uh, parties and. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately for for their businesses, most of their businesses has been significantly affected by 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 the war and the destruction and the, and the occupation. So, uh, but I, I also want to to bring to your attention another very important factor that in Ukraine, of course, now uh, with the war, uh, there is it's not like there's no demand for any corrupted interest. This is a a, a taboo. Uh, nobody will uh, nobody would even dare. I mean, to to do something uh, so, something beyond. And if they they have been now convicted by the National Anti Corruption Bureau, and we see it's all public and it's uh, it's massive. Uh, but even before the full scale war, the the demand for that was was extremely low because uh, uh, because of the European integration, because uh, some of the things become more important and become clear that it's not enough just to lobby one piece of legislation uh, in, in the parliament because it would not really have this effect because we uh, were about to go through the green transition and this has been a major agenda and they knew clearly that they will not get access to any f significant financing if they are not structuring or whitening or cleansing their their business structure, uh, if they do not uh, do not operate in a in a in a global standards, because basically they they, they the hunger and the appetites are growing, but the world is different. So so uh, the whole transformation from various areas has happened. And by the end of the day, I'm just a human being. I'm not only a de deputy prime minister. I do regular things. And uh, uh, I can I can say it from my experience, I haven't uh, been uh, in touch with any official uh, for uh, for anything which I might need from the administrative structure because I have DIA application, uh, which is uh, a, an application on your smartphone uh, where you can get hundred percent of all services without uh, like knowing even the one who's providing them. So 
So, um, so it's it's been a massive effort, and we redoubled it over over the year. Of course, we're not perfect because we have a, like a dozens of convictions and and uh, hearings in the court, which is not pleasant when you're like uh, having breakfast with one of your con colleagues, and then in the evening he's detained by let's say uh, by by the law enforcement. But for us, for me, uh, it's a good. Uh, good, a uh, good thing uh, to see. And uh, um, again, we should understand that this has been um, a part of the real, uh, the real problems that we had in this area. This has been also a key element of Russian propaganda, first and foremost. And secondly, Ukraine has been affiliated with Russia for a very, very long time. So, and something which could have been easily replicated to, to Russia has been affiliated, uh, Ukraine has been affiliated with. Now, uh, my feeling, correct me if I'm wrong, I hope I'm not, so uh, there is a clear understanding that Ukraine is now Russia. Ukraine is different. Ukrainians are different as a nation, by mentality, by understanding, by actions, by everything. So, um, so, so I think all of these uh, elements are serving positively into shaping up the new picture of Ukraine, but still a lot of work to be done. The whole world has came up to know Ukraine and Ukrainians, but there is still a lot of leftovers from the old narratives, old processes, and we are, of course, cleansing our roles, uh, roles but still it's a long way ahead. No, I think you're uh, exactly right. And if anything, um, Ukraine has sort of uh, confirmed to Europeans themselves, I think, that the importance of the EU, the importance of, uh, of that European identity in Ukraine, I think, fervently wanting to be part of, of Europe, not part of the Russian sphere, I think, has been, uh, I mean, it's obvious to, to anyone that has been, uh, been, has their eyes open over the last, last year. One of the, I want to maybe um, ask about one potential challenge when we think about Ukraine's potential asc uh, ascension to uh, both the EU and potentially NATO. Um, you know, right now when we're looking at Sweden, for instance, being held up by Turkey, you know, Hungary has also not uh, approved uh, a membership for for Sweden. They they were one of the last on Finland. Uh, there's been obviously tension, uh, some tension between. Uh, Hungary and, and Ukraine. Uh, Viktor Orban has, has not been uh, willing to provide weapons to Ukraine, although Hungary is uh, hosting uh, Ukrainian refugees. Uh, but there's been, I was in Budapest last fall, a lot of complaints about Ukrainian language laws and, and Hungarian claims of being discriminated against. Uh, maybe you could talk about that and, and, and the steps that you're taking and, and how you see the, the Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's relationship with, with Hungary. Uh, well, I think uh, it's uh, uh, bilateral relations of Ukraine with Hungary. They have originally uh, um, been set up for 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 a long period of time, and then a number of uh, of cases you've mentioned they they uh, um, distanced us uh, a bit uh, from each other. Mm, but uh, I think it's uh, when we're talking about Hungary, uh, for example, I think it's it's not that much important um, in terms of the bilateral relations between Ukraine and Hungary as keeping uh, Hungary as the as the uh, in the family. Mm -hmm. Uh, keeping Hungary in the family, and this is the task for 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 everybody. And I I think uh, uh, this is something we should all keep in mind while while thinking of uh, various decisions uh, we're taking. I can only confirm that we have reestablished a number of contacts on issues uh, of concern when it comes to the minorities and the education stuff. Things are going well on track on here, but again, it's it's not somewhere on the topest issue of, of the agenda. We simply manage it on um, uh, through our daily um, uh, daily daily work, uh, but still, again, um, of course, uh, every case is is very individual. And when you're talking about Sweden and Sweden not yet becoming a member of NATO, um, uh, I can uh, I nearly started crying when I I was looking on the map because. Uh, not being a member of NATO for Sweden is not equal to not being a member of NATO for Ukraine, because Sweden is now surrounded 
by Norway and Finland, mm -hmm. so, which means that all of the territory of Sweden is covered by the NATO territory, which is not the case for Ukraine purely from the physical point of view, from the map point of view. So, so um, it just shows that every case is very different and, and very, very, very individual. And the level of frustration, again, could be different. Um, uh, so uh, so this is the perspective where we're thinking, we're just treating everything as an in individual, uh, by individual approach. And of course, for Ukraine, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's obvious that uh, Ukraine cannot be compared with any other countries of enlargement with the European Union, we often hear that we should uh, um, get a broader understanding on enlargement and then Ukraine will come. But in fact, before Ukraine applied for membership, enlargement per se was a taboo discussion in European Union. A taboo, there were, I can confirm it from my visits to Berlin, to Paris, to, to, to the many, many other capitals. But what came after Ukraine applied for membership? Ukraine and Georgia got the candidate status. Um, a European perspective has been confirmed for Georgia, uh, and has it, this has been another instrument of uh, of holding Georgia in a family again. And uh, look what happened next: Bosnia and Herzegovina, one of the Western Balkan countries, received the candidate status. I can promise you that it would never ever literally happen for this country if it wasn't for Ukraine to, to launch all of this, to keep all of this uh, wheel running. So the transformative potential of Ukraine is huge internally, but we have been changing the, the global and geopolitical agenda uh, as well. Uh, so we do not expect any backlashes or delays, uh, delays on our side, uh, but also we want uh, uh, to uh, other countries of uh, of NATO, particularly, also to learn the lessons of the previous decades, which basically led us to be uh, in a situation of the full scale war and the the massive atrocious military uh, massacre. I would say uh, uh, in the center of Europe, in the heart of Europe, uh, in twenty first century. This has something which uh, resulted from the ambiguity and indecisiveness over the last two decades. And I can assure you that knowing Ukrainians and knowing uh, our new selves as we have re redefined ourselves over the last year, uh, Ukraine could have implemented a membership actions plan three times already and became a member of NATO, a strong and reliable member member of NATO. Uh, and uh, and this is the, the saddest thing to hear that still uh, after our children, our best soldiers are dying on a battlefield, women's being raped and tortured uh, throughout the territory of Ukraine. Still, there is a room for now willingness to irritate Russia with uh, with various things so there's still uh, still many things frustrating for ukraine mm -hmm. but uh, we still um, but at the same time we feel empowered to to change things we still can change let me ask you um about um maybe your engagement with some other countries that are also you know waiting to to join the european union and i i completely agree with you without ukraine uh uh fighting for europe uh the enlargement process had 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 essentially come to a halt and had all but died for countries in, in the Western Balkans, even some countries that were uh, hitting uh, the EU criteria, such as North Macedonia. Um, part, of, part of what sort of concerns me right now about potential Ukraine, uh, about an obstacle to Ukrainian membership, is that uh, while there's progress now on the enlargement and ascension process, we're not seeing um, uh, any sort of treaty reform efforts within the EU. You know, before countries like Poland and in the Baltic states, before 2004, the EU went through dec you know, a decade of treaty of new treaties, the Treaty of Nice, the Treaty of Amsterdam, uh, then eventually resulting in, in the, the Treaty of Lisbon, which sort of governs the EU today. And I think there's a lot of concern in Western European states that, you know, the EU with 27 members where everyone has a veto, it's sort of there needs to be some reform to how the EU functions, but uh, many of your closest neighbors and allies, Poland and the Baltic states, have, have opposed 
uh, the EU engaging in this process of treaty reform. Does that concern you at all that the lack of action when it comes to internal reform of the EU could become an obstacle for uh, for potential Ukrainian membership? Well, um, uh, I can't say that it is concerning me uh, very much for for a couple of reasons. Because as as you've mentioned, there is uh, uh, there's already been a, a various waves of evolution, which which shows that there is like uh, uh, the, uh, the issue on, of uh, undecisiveness is is not there. Um, what I can also say is uh, the lessons learned from from this war, as you can imagine. On 24th of February, I've been made calls to everywhere I could, to every country, every international organizations. I've been running the humanitarian stuff, and and we, we tr so um, over the uh, only the first week of the full scale war, we had the whole picture of everyone who are capable and who are incapable, and what should be done on every side. So I can literally confirm that a part of us has been leading the efforts on the military support and and and, and the structuring geopolitical agenda european union has been one of the most operational structures uh, able to adjust so um so i think what you're saying is is the 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 time for evolution of this idea need to need to pass so remember the discussion macron was uh, was holding on the strategic compass the strategic autonomy and etc it has taken years and it's been a idea flying uh, somewhere uh, uh, in in brussels uh, but now we see clearly structured security and defense policy and the agenda and the real basis and a meet on that uh, so so it takes time uh, as well as uh, as uh, uh, as as other issues which uh, which uh, like the new uh, the new set of obligations for you member states on national resilience and the resilience for the critical infrastructure this is they are the front runners so while we're just learning our lessons and it's only one month after spring you know when the winter has been over and we survived that and the whole world is just like uh, still reflecting on that they have uh, adopted the new set of regulations setting the obligatory framework to protect the critical infrastructure to ensure the national resilience so the time should come and now the um transformation of EU treaty and the substance of it is not that obvious. It's not that obvious. And I don't think, frankly, that it will happen before Ukraine's membership in European Union. So only when the conditions of Ukraine membership will be set, it will be more clear what could be the next steps in that regard. Let me ask you as a, a final question. Uh, what do you see the role of the United States in potential EU membership? Obvi obviously, we have a, a, a huge role in potential NATO membership for Ukraine, and I think you know the administration right now is is still sort of on the fence, a little wary. Um, but I'm curious, um, you know, do you see the EU process as just the EU process? Is there a role for the United States to play in in you know pushing? Brussels or pushing certain members, what, what do you think, what should we be doing or thinking about here in Washington? Well, thank you, Max, uh, for this message. I'm, I'm extremely pleased that it's now not the official meetings with the U.S. administration. So I'll take the privilege of ha having this venue, venue of the think tank, to be like more open uh, in things. Uh, in things uh, I, I would like to say. That's why we uh, exist. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I would say two major elements. First, uh, seriously speaking. I mean, accomplishing on the political reforms agenda is equally important for everything, for the future of Ukraine, for the victory of Ukraine, for the post-war reconstruction, for the investments and then the bilateral relations between Ukraine and, uh, and U.S. So I think uh, and basically uh, I have received this message formally from the U.S. administration that the political criteria are equally important for everybody standing with Ukraine these days. But but secondly, I think that um, uh, uh, thinking of NATO from the U.S. perspective as the major um, major instrument for Europeans preserving European security as well, uh, I think stepping up with Ukraine's membership in NATO politically 
would be crucial for membership in European Union because this would immediately lift out uh, a million of questions uh, in that regard. And, and I think that as the European Union is now helping uh, US to structure Ukraine's political agenda, I think US could help with the, uh, with the, with the stepping up on a decision for Ukraine's membership to NATO, which is obvious. Um, of course, for taking into account the current security situation, it's not a decision which uh, should be taken uh, tomorrow or uh, any time very soon. But there is a will uh, which needed to be mobilized to take something which is obvious. And of course, it takes leadership and it is complicated for decision to be taken after decades of fatigue and the raising uh, let's say role of china in a, in a, in a different uh, um, efforts and, and and the peace plans but again this there are some decisions which should be taken and it is one of them and i think it would be extremely instrumental for uh, for everything which will be happening in the world for the next decade great well Deputy Prime Minister, I want to thank you so much for joining us today uh, here at CSIS virtually, uh, and uh, and I want to thank you for all the work that you're doing, uh, not just on behalf of Ukraine, but also, as you noted throughout the conversation, uh, on behalf of, of Europe and the, the Transatlantic Alliance. And I think it's been a, a real inspiration uh, to everyone uh, of all the efforts that we see both on the front lines, but then also back in Kyiv where there's real uh, uh, tangible reform taking place that, um, you know, for Ukraine to hopefully uh, have their European dream of joining the European Union and NATO. So I want to thank you for that. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Max. Thank you, colleagues. It was my pleasure. Great. Thank you. Th thank you all for joining us online as well. Thank you. <music>